everybody. Welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about classical stuff that you should know from the ancient world, uh, old things, old books, old paintings, art, music, dance. Um, all the stuff <laughs> dance, from... What? Well, we haven't done a dance one yet. Um, but uh, we're a podcast, so it doesn't really fit. Um, anyway, we are three guys who like the classical world and classical education. We work at a school in Austin, Texas called Veritas Academy, which is a Christian classical school. And my name is Graham Donaldson, and I am joined with my colleagues, Mr. A.J. Hannenberg. Hey. And Mr. Thomas Maybe. Hello. Are you, are you doing like playing a, with a Doppler effect? Okay, I like it. Um, you're, you're, you're like a metronome. Anyway. Right? Uh, yeah, just leaning back and if forth. You've, <laughs> Or if you're still listening, um, <laughs> you can find us at classicalstuff.net. You can tweet at us at CLSSCAL stuff net. No, what? Twitter. <laughs> at twi- oh at Twitter. C L S S C A L stuff on Twitter. Dot Twitter. And dot, I will um, mainly retweet classical memes. Um, you can find us on Patreon where we you can patronize us. We have in between episodes where we banter. Um, at, oh my at, word. At Instagram. We. <laughs> Uh, what else do we got? <laughs> Slash R. <laughs> Some Wait, credit. You guys are terrible. <laughs> Sorry. Check out our uh, um, anyway. MySpace page. It's uh, it's great. It's updated frequently. We have oh, it's, we still got it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> we're uh, we're expanding into Zanga. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this so funny? Sorry, you guys are you guys are the worst. I'm so sorry. I did not take. This your is how intro. I feel during did every I one of my intro? episodes. I <laughs> didn't take your intro. No, you take my episodes, <laughs> not my <laughs> intros. <laughs> Okay, anyway, uh, Megby, you are here to talk t- to us about the French, I yeah, think. Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> you having fun over there? What's happening? Ooh. I wasn't even listening to you guys while you were talking. I think the I'm... part that's tough is that this is our first day back of recording in like a month, and we're on like our last episode, so uh, we're, we're hanging in there, I hope. I am <laughs> professional. You are highly professional, yes, and exactly. I've come with loaded loads of questions. Can you and start, topics and, you'd like to talk about during Thomas's episodes? <laughs> we talk about everything. <laughs> exactly. I don't even understand. What are you talking about? What did you want to talk about? <laughs> it's messed up. Um, okay. Gnostics. Let's talk about Gnosticism. Let's talk about heresy. Okay. So I will be talking about a book. Graham tells me and AJ because they're cultured humans uh, that they would titled Montaillou. M M. You wouldn't say it that way. M O N T A I L L O U. I will Montaillou. Mi- Montaillou. I will. Texas Montaillou. <laughs> well, that's maybe this is the place to start. Is that I will literally mispronounce everything from here on out. And since I've been talking about it as Montaillou, I'm going to keep calling it Montaillou. So if that bothers you, this probably isn't the right podcast for you. Can I say that? Can I say that? <laughs> you can probably say that. Okay, good. Uh, but we will be talking about this hey, book. It is a rich tapestry of life. What where is? we all have different ways of saying different names. So I, what my is? name is spelled G R A E M E, and I went to a French school yep. growing up. Graham. And if you don't think, and they no French teacher pronounced it Graham. That's how it's pronounced. It's Graham. <laughs> for years, Graham. I was Graham. Even uh, this is a uh, so the word quixotic, which comes from Don Quixote, mm-hmm. comes from the fact that um, it, British people don't care about how things are. <laughs> this, I'm overgeneralizing. I got this from a lecture series, but they'll anglicize any thing that they're talking about. Exactly. So Don Quixote, they will call Don Quixote. Yeah, like that is anyway. So that's where that's why we call it quixotic you instead gotta, of. It's okay. Holding. You're from Texas. I, this is well, just I'm from Georgia, it. but well, you're from you know the southern part. Uh, sure, Texas. Yeah, whatever. So. I, I, George is the South, and this is the Southwest, right? Isn't that okay? None of this matters. What? Okay, <laughs> We're in the uh, middle. Do you want to talk about regional differences? Okay, so we will be talking about this book, Montelu, which you know, cultured people pronounce differently. This is. I'm following this as a part two or a continuation of a theme we started with uh, a history of private life, which was before our you know snowpocalypse break. Snowpocalypse? No. What what do I call this? In the before times. In the before times. Before (laughs) the snow. Before the ice. So. Your. Oh, the times of your? Is that? Okay. Mm. You. I was waiting for the rest of that sentence. Your what? In times of your. Mm, Good. So do you all remember this delightful episode uh, on a history of private life? Yes. What do you you remember about that conversation? Um, It was talking about Roman households. (laughs) Yes. But then it was also, the episode was also about the methodology that the historians themselves were using to talk about Roman households. Yes. So critical theory. Critical theory ended up being an important place we ended in talking about their approach to understanding and studying history. So, uh, and again, 
critical theory isn't the specific they don't claim critical theory in there but the uh the thinkers that they thank in the beginning of the book are um critical theorists so that's that's the connection the godfathers of critical yes. theory godfathers and, that's, that, and godmothers of yeah they uh it's uh, Foucault and um um Marcuse that they're thinking so uh two men so you know they're thinking grandfathers of critical th- or fathers whatever they founded it i guess anyway um that's more anyway so they are thinking um people in that kind of line of critical theory and that's the connection i was making which then influences the method of history that they use to look at rome that's what you all just said what was distinct about their method what do you all remember about how they approached rome they it, talked about <clears throat> everyday ordinary people not like the great households they didn't talk about the caesars they right. talked they they were talking about the general populace. Yes. Yeah, approaching history as the interaction between oppressor and oppressed. Yes. So both both of these are true of again, literally the definition of like private life that they're talking about is as an opposition to public life. Public life would be, you know, a speaker getting up and giving a speech, right? That's publicly presented. That's public life. Um, a person's job in the day-to-day. That's a public life that they have. Private life is trying to look then at the household, right? So uh, outside of Uh, what can be seen by people generally, what can we say, what can we know about what private life was like? Then kind of an extension of that basis of critical theory then led to most interactions being understood in purely economic terms and in purely class Mm -hmm. terms. So there were these common people who lacked power that certain people in positions of power had. Those people in positions of power would use that to oppress or, you know, take advantages of uh, uh, take advantage of those uh, lower down the social spectrum. Right. That's kind of the, the, you know, two minute version of what was an hour and a half long conversation. So I'm, you know, wish you all could have only been subjected to the two minute version instead of the hour and a half version. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, I liked it. That's very kind of you to say. Um, you so put it at like 10 X speed, you'll, <laughs> you'll make it through in just the same amount of time. No, <laughs> okay. So that was one end of an approach to history. And when you take into account the, in between episode that we added on for everyone to listen to, we ended in a place of saying there's something helpful. Uh, maybe there was a spectrum of, you know, where we landed on things. I would say, I think it's helpful to understand why this approach to history exists. What is the reason that someone who is a critical theorist would say they're using critical theory? It's to focus on the differences of power between different groups of people that you might underemphasize if you're only taking, you know, so-and-so gave a speech, we take it at its face value. And then that's history. That's the good of it. We ended by saying overall a bad approach to history, but there's something that could be useful here. So one extreme of history was critical theory. We talked about last time here, we're going to swing to the exact opposite end of the spectrum in a way of approaching history. So in our book today titled Montelou, you all know what Montelou is. Does this name ring a bell? Montelou, Montelou is a village in the South of France, and we are covering a period of time for the, primary documents that are used for this book go from 1318 to 1325. It's a seven year period. And we're talking about 250 people who lived in this village, lived in and around this village. So instead of, you know, in 200 pages with a history of private life, we covered, you know, a thousand years and thousands of people here. We're going to talk about 250 people over seven years and it's a 350 page book. So we're going, you know, it's a, you know, like a, more than a page per person, which is kind of a crazy thing to think about. So total opposite end. Ultimately, the point of bringing this here is to talk about these two different approaches to history. What do we like? What do we not like? Which one is better or in which situations is one better than the other? We'll get there at the very end. Okay. Our author for, is author the right word? Our historian who will be guiding us through this uh, information is uh, the subtitle for this should be like Magby butchers the French language. I apologize in advance. We can make that happen to make it the actual subtitle. Oh, yeah. That is actually true, unfortunately. So the his name is Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie. Ladurie, Ladurie. No, how did you say it? Sure, it's good. <laughs> it's not. It's I have to see. It sounds legit. Okay, if you all, yeah, uh, I'm I'm sure YouTubers will just see Graham and AJ flinching every time. I'm. Well, one question, oh. was there something particularly notable that happened in those seven years, or is it just that we had documents well, from those seven years? Well, I guess those both go together, and I'll get to that in a second. Okay. There is uh, there's a thing that happened, which is why excellent notes were taken for gotcha. seven years okay. in Montreal. Because I was wondering, I was like, 
What Either a weird, yeah, he they, just this us. particular town was really fastidious, <laughs> like they just had a scribe who was super, yeah. like anal retentive about yes. everything, or yes. something big happened. Happened, and so something big happened, and that's why these documents are well kept during this time. Because gotcha. we we have very little information before this time, and very little information after this time until you know modern day, essentially. Okay. So let, let's talk about this. Uh, our historian, just before going into it, Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie, he is. Um, uh, he's trained in this method of um, this method of history called the Annales method. And, you know, I'm not, we're not going that into French history to talk about like types of methods. The, the point of this is that he's in a school of thought, which includes uh, George Dewey, who was one of the two main editors of history of private life. So mm-hmm. uh, Emmanuel uh, uh, Leroy Lettery comes after Dubuis in the school of thought, he's, you know, he's called like the, uh, the head of the third wave of, um, uh, Annales, uh, method. A, a, another way that he's described that I very much love is that he's the rock star of the med- medievalists. So there you go for, a, how would you like to be Man, called? French the, in their waves. Yes, exactly. Yes. That you would be called a rock star for being the head of a wave of history <laughs> is just a fascinating thing to me. But that's the point. He, uh, he, proposed and, and did a, a method of history that kind of um, superseded what George Dubuis was doing. But they follow in the same line of thought, is all I'm trying to say. So they're in a type of conversation with each other, I guess I would say. Um, we talked about critical theory, that it um, largely gets its start from Karl Marx. Karl Marx used critical theory to paint a picture of history as, again, this kind of never-ending conflict between um, those in power and those out of power, the um, oppressor and the oppressed, that's um, that's Marxism. Marxism, I think, I would say, starts as a set of historical tools. Um, Lettery does not like communism. Is your fun fact for the day? Um, I'll just read this. As all of our information does, it comes from Wikipedia. Um, in January 1978, uh, Leroy Lettery was a founding member of the Committee of Intellectuals for a Euro- uh, Europe of Liberties, an anti-communist group of liberal French intellectuals opposed to the powerful influence of the French Communist Party on French intellectual life and the alliance of the socialists and the communists, which they saw as a threat to French democracy. I think that's important as a starting place. He's not going to use the same tools of analysis because he has a different political bent going into his project. Is that fair? Mm-hmm. I guess is that um, okay. So I'm sure there's more to be said. He's still alive. He's 91 years old. He lives in the northwest of France. If you want to go visit him, I guess. But uh, that is lottery. Okay. So, gentlemen, today I almost quoted um, "Oh, the places you'll go." Today is your day. Um, we are going to start a cult together, the three of us. I'm excited. Right. Can we wear red. Uh, so t- yeah. So we're going to all wear red. Now are these red robes? Are these red? What? Tell me about this red. Uh. So. Only crew neck sweatshirts. Crew neck sweatshirts. Okay. And then ro- like big skirt bottoms, okay. like big kilts. Good. Um, I, of all the things to first jump at, I'm, you know, I'm glad the clothing is the first big one. big yellow suns right wow. here on the front. Oh, I kind of like this. Wow. Okay. So red with yellow suns. I like this. Give me a good look. Yeah. Well, um, well, let's let's talk about our cult that we're starting. We probably need a name for our cult. Do you want to give me a name for ye old cult? Uh, who's the... Hold on. Let me think. Horace's acolytes of love. Horace's acolytes of love, and um, in the, what isn't Horace the god of the sun? Sure, thinking Horace. No, that's a, he's an Egyptian god. <laughs> he's Egyptian. Well, who, who's, who am I thinking? Uh, Hephaestus. The cattle of the sun. The, uh, what's his name? Helios. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so we are Helios's acolytes of love. Yes. Okay. Um, and what what makes our cult special? What do we believe? We believe that the sun is a giant burning ball of love okay. and that from the sun we receive love and thereby give it out. And okay. we, we, we are not active at nighttime. We believe nighttime is filled with evil and hatred. Okay. And so we, we only grow like we, we are when it's, when it's lights off, it's lights out. We okay. are, we go to sleep. Um, and anything that the sun touches mm-hmm. is, is owned by the sun and therefore owned by us. Okay. And so all all property is held in common, and we own all things. Oh, this is interesting. So um, you're already setting up that probably our you know whoever follows us they don't actually own the stuff, Correct. right? So um, we own all their stuff, and then we have rights to actually use it. Or are you a, are you a, a yeah? And even more so, yeah. like we if we want to usurp someone's house, yes. 
we we own that as well as they do, okay. right? We own well, all things. Yes. Insofar as the sun is hitting the house, as, like yes, if the exactly. house is some in some. If sort it's of built in a valley, we don't go there. We got nothing there. for it. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like we'd start like cutting down trees to make sure that sun can mm-hmm. hit. Uh, all well, we own the trees. So <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like this. Good. Uh, Graham, anything you want to add to like the beliefs of our cult? Uh, just that uh, you know some of the the basic rituals are uh, sunbathing to charge our love. Sunbathing kind of thing. sounds good. Yeah, I like yeah. this. Uh, we wear Crocs. And we wear partially Crocs. because they're nice and soft and partially because of a corporate corporate sponsorship. So we do have a cor- So we are cult with a corporate sponsor. We're are, modern cult. We are modern cult. Are these, yeah. are these red Crocs? We have a great web- website. Um, it is one of the only places where we are allowed to express our love wow. color. Okay, good. I really appreciate this. Okay. So we have our, we have a, uh, I've actually been taking notes on this, which I, you know, why, why? Uh, so with, with Helios's acolytes of love, um, how would you go about spreading this you know, you, you need members, right? You need people to buy into this belief that whatever the sun touches, we suddenly own. How do you go about getting people sold on that idea? You need a creation, fall, redemption story. Like uh, you need to have tell some me? kind okay. of. Um, so the sun, we, I mean, we're all di- divine sparks from the, okay. from the sun, <laughs> okay. right? We all come from sun stuff. Okay. Um, so the sun is a burning ball of love and we are but small sparks of love. But. Existence in this modern world has snuffed out our love. And okay. loneliness separates us from the wholeness of, That's right. of all things. Um, and by existing indoors and by having electricity that allows us to be around at night, it slowly is draining us of our sun love. Okay. Um, and so by um, rejecting these things and by partaking in, you know, sun love rituals that we can, we can re- slowly stoke the fires and regain regain our divinity i like it so we have a story that explains like the validity of the beliefs that we hold but we still need people to buy into we this story we hold cor- corporate summits at our beautifully placed um desert retreat okay. and we also we also sell timeshares uh-huh. um, but the timeshares are on cult grounds so people will, like will buy the timeshare and then because they have already sunk three grand into owning the timeshare they'll show up and then they'll see what a wonderful community we have They'll take part in our early morning yoga practice, mm-hmm. okay, um, which is to, uh, obviously to suck up the sun. Yes, and we, you know we ease them into the community because uh, community is ultimately that thing that's going to pull people in. Mm-hmm. I like it. So I'm I'm shocked at how well we line up with like an actual heresy that we're going to be talking about. So uh, you all are great cult leaders, I guess is my takeaway from this. In an earlier life, I was a cult leader. I think. Oh, it's oh, is reincarnation also a part of our um, beliefs? Yeah, because energy okay. can neither be created nor destroyed. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I like this one. So uh, it's, yeah, like we're very thermodynamic. So <laughs> we are very. Um, can that be our tagline? Mm-hmm. We are very. Are very. I don't know why I'm taking notes on this. Okay, so <laughs> well, thermodynamic dynamism is a big part of the belief. It's, yeah, I mean, yeah. all of this is very, very important. It's actually, again, shockingly, will line up with where we're going um, <laughs> with our topic for the day. So I, I like this very. It's much. really scary how much I'm enjoying this part of the. Uh, podcast. Yeah, you'd be a great cult leader. I think yeah. is my takeaway right there. Well, Thomas, you, I mean, if, you, if you cultivated the fire within, mm, yeah, <laughs> I, I feel like I've done a horrible thing by exposing like all of our podcast listeners to this idea. Anyway, if you would like to join Helios's acolytes of love, you can pronounce it whole. H a o l whole. If you if you would like to be made whole, uh, you can find us at patreon.com dot slash classical stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, good. You like that? Good. Okay. Underscore whole. <laughs> I wish we could do that. I like that. This is good. Can you, can you start a cult on Patreon? There's your real question. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what? who's not to say that like, well, if you want yeah. to be one of our solarites, then <laughs> can we add a hundred dollar a month level? That's solarite. I love this. Oh, this is a good idea. Okay. Uh, Send this, you a robe. Yeah. Uh, no, like, for a hundred bucks. I mean, come on, man. Maybe, maybe, maybe one croc. I, don't, I, I, mean. I actually kind of want that crew neck sweatshirt that is like a, a red crew neck with a big yellow sun right dead center. I would buy, I would wear that. You want to make that our first piece of merch? That'd be great. Oh, my Good deal. Let's do that. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's follow with our cult as compared. We'll, uh, we'll try and bring it in as we talk about uh, a real cult that, a uh, cult maybe is the wrong word, a real heresy that, uh, uh, you're really happy about this one. I like yeah, I this. Just this is thought, good. I thought of a new joke. We could have uh, our governing body uh-huh. be 30 people and we call it the whole 30. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's good. Um, I would love for 30 people to support us at $100 a month. Come on, let's do that. Come on. Um, okay, so uh, we are talking about a heresy called Catharism. I hope I'm, again, uh, all, all I'm here to do is butcher both the English and French languages. Um, Cathars, what, what do we know about Catharism? Uh, it was I thought sexy. it was sexy. I thought it was a breed of cat, so I'm, I think I'm is, already yeah. wrong. Well, yeah, they um, they would all put on little cat ears and just kind of run around. Right, yeah, yeah. Tell me if I'm way off. Um, it uh, 
Part of it had to do with clergy were allowed to get married. This is a complicated one. Um, or that there was something – that there was some kind of um, spiritual practice that revolved around sex, if I remember it correctly. Yeah, so I wouldn't – so uh, th- maybe this will come out as we talk more. Um, or that was a charge that was against them to get them into trouble. Wh- uh, I can't remember. Oh, well, let me go into it because this will, this will okay. tie in with different points and then I, I think I, I think I can think of the parts that you're thinking of. So um, – uh, if I were to like way boil down, what is this heresy called Catharism? Um, it is a form of Gnosticism. Um, Gnosticism being this distinction between body and soul. Uh, dualism is another fun word for it. So, you know, at its base level, it's a form of Gnosticism that would say the body is bad. The spirit is good. That's like kind of your base level thing that okay. Cathars believe. Mm-hmm. And you'll get lots of distinctions of what, how Cathar practices lived out, depending on what, um, area you're from it kicks off in the uh what um late 11th century um so kind of or le- i think late 11th early 12th century so you know 1100s ish time and continues through to um the um, 14th century which is what we'll be talking about today so 1300s um and there are some people that talk about where it comes from but it mostly resides in the south of france which is what we'll be talking about today and i think in italy was another kind of hotbed of it um, another name that you'll hear this heresy called is Albigensian, Albigensianism, hmm. and that's in reference to this, the French city of Albi, A-L-B-I, that where a bunch of heretics lived. So that's where you get these two names. And I think there are technically differences between the two, but I don't have them, so get over it. So, <laughs> okay, so um, there's this uh, distinction of spirit, good, body. He's made all the Cathars out there. Right? <laughs> He's really mad about this. I think they're all dead i'm sorry <laughs> that so um all the spirits who are listening to this podcast i'm so sorry um so um uh, uh neo-gnostic dualist uh, body bad spirit good um there there was this distinction between members of catharite catharitic i don't know um uh, uh, uh society there are kind of these like the the common people and there are the the higher ups and the higher ups are called parfaits which confused me. Thank you. I'm glad you all are laughing as much as I was through this entire book. Cause I'm like, I don't like this at all. Um, uh, what, what is a parfait? It's granola and yogurt. Yeah, it's exactly right. With so, maybe some blueberries. It's, it's they exactly are, right. Frankly, they're delicious. They're delicious. I yeah. love me a good parfait. It's ice cream, fruit. Um, yeah. It's is that a, like a body soul thing? Like granola? Yogurt? That's exactly right. We're kind of the mixture of uh, <laughs> granola and Stir yogurt, them up, I guess. Mix them together. Yeah, so. Can't separate them again. I've never had it because it's Gnostic. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's wonderful. Food. I'm so sorry. You're a wonderful uh, parfait. Um, so it, it made me laugh the first time I read it. And then it's used like, you know, a thousand times throughout the book. What does parfait actually mean? Does it mean perfect? It means perfect. Um, so um, the, the highest tier of people are called the perfects is you know and the highest tier of food is granola is the parfait yeah exactly so it's a it's a really a a yogurt based religion not wrong um so the uh the heads of this in this religion were called parfaits they were called the perfects and they were ascetics they would deny themselves physical pleasures um well in their ideology they would say they would do that Graham tied in with what you're saying very few of them actually did this Mm -hmm. if you know depending on time we'll get to a story of um essentially every like major Cathar in Montelieu abuses their power because they have power. Right. Um, so, uh, the, uh, they were ascetic. They would deny themselves meat specifically. They were largely vegetarian except for fish. Uh, this ties in with a Cathar belief that soul, what? Cause screw fish. Yeah, fish right? Well, kind of because <laughs> screw those things. Eat those guys. <laughs> for some, for, uh, I think I think the fancy word is metempsychosis. Um, I think that's the word. Sorry if I've offended someone with that one too. Um, so when people in the Cathar belief, when a person dies, their soul leaves the body and then goes into like the next nearest um, fetus that's nearby, which could be an animal fetus or it could be a, a human. So like you know, if you kill a cow the the spirit leaves and if you know a woman is pregnant nearby the cow soul can go into the human I had no idea. fetus uh, well it, it's not true oh, Graham. Okay. sorry just to be clear this is this is a heresy oh, i don't i would well. i would like keep a lot of alligator and tiger oh eggs gosh. around oh, oh, oh some, sorry <laughs> some dragon eggs well, maybe i don't know if, uh, if tigers to capture grow all these, like, eggs, spirits, as they but uh, i don't think they <laughs> wait hold on um so tiger babies tiger babies that's right uh this seems can that be a part of our religion also is tigers um so they were this was the reason the reason for this vegetarianism at least as expressed in montelieu again uh catharism changes a lot depending on where you are um another thing that defined them is that there was this um they rejected the sacraments of the church and they had their own sacrament called consolation 
um, and there's a French word for it, but I'm not going to say it because I'm tired of embarrassing myself. Um, this consolation was a kind of baptism, but it, there was no water. So, you know, a baptism without water. Um, but, uh, they would use um, books. They would hold a book against the person's head. And that was like the, the, you know, instead of like a sprinkling of water, it was like a sprinkling of book. Uh the, part of this is like books were rare back then. So this, you know, actually meant something. Okay. Uh, another defining thing that fits in. Are you like, what, what is that? Twilight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they picked their whole list it was of books. The most, it was the closest yeah, they thing. They picked the one about sparkling vampires. Yes, for sure. Um, <laughs> so uh, another <laughs> fitting in with this asceticism is that uh, there was a Cathar practice called the Endura. Um, this is uh, when a person was about to die, they would um, stop eating food. Um, so they would fast. It, Fast feels like the wrong word. They would starve themselves to death is what the Endura was. And the Endura was meant as a way of guaranteeing that someone would go to heaven, that by experiencing the Endura, you would guarantee a spot in heaven is no. the reason. <laughs> Thank you for that. Where'd they find that coupon? Like how'd they, you know, get, the, how'd they well, get the inroads on the like I do feel this way monthly about, 20% discount coupon? You know what I mean? I feel this way about most of the beliefs in here. Um, and if it's anything like... Montelieu, which again, I promise we're getting to, uh, um, people weren't literate. So in this 250 person town, uh, um, the, the percent is that 2% could read. So what is that? You know, five people or whatever could read. Right. So like, um, if you were told something was true, it was, you could, um, interrogate it by talking with other people, but you couldn't refer back to the Bible to see if it's true or not. So that's part of the problem of like, well, how would they know if it was true or not? Um, uh, they, they had fewer ways to like, um, discern something being true. Right. Especially if all the parfaits are in concert yeah, with exactly each other. Right. It's like, man, I just want that granola. Um, and if, and the parfaits were like good speakers, the perfects were good speakers. And so, um, you know, it's the age old problem of charismatic people who want power would use any means to it. You know, this heresy was just another way of, of getting that, of getting that I mean, power. If I was a parfait, I wouldn't want people eating either. That's exactly right. Yeah. It's a really cannibalistic, uh, religion also. Okay. So, um, uh, this doesn't, it's not really, yeah, I'll go through it because I'm all about, it's not irrelevant, but it's not super relevant. Uh, so um, leading up to the time of this book, there's a, uh, a, a an event called the Albigen, Albigensian Crusade or the Cathar Crusade. This uh, was, uh, I guess the, you'd say the start of the, it's, it, it is a crusade, but it's, it's the kickoff of the Inquisitions, right? So mm. the initial... Um, heresy that's being sought out in the Inquisition is Catharism, which uh, a thing I didn't know. So this is like what makes Catharism very important. Um, this is kicked off by there's essentially this like 150, 200 year time where um, the popes are trying to play nice with Catharism, where instead of like out and out going to like kill people, they are sending missionaries to go and talk to the Cathars in these different cities, debate with them, talk with them, try and, you know, convince them that they're wrong and you know, Gnosticism is bad. Uh, over the course of this time, there are many holdouts who don't change their mind. Eventually a Pope sends, um, he sends a representative to go and excommunicate someone for sticking to the Catharism on the way. I forget if, if it's on the way there or back, but it, you know, in the, in the process of doing this excommunication, this person gets killed. They're murdered. And, uh, this is what escalates things, you know, by it, Cathars, by Cathar. Well, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we don't know who actually killed them, but they were going to, um, excommunicate a Cathar Dang. might have actually done it and then come back, which, you know, points to the Cathars being the ones who did it. Well, that takes things from two to 11 and kicks off this crusade where I'm just like, it, it ramps up. Mm -hmm. the, okay. So, um, uh, things go bad for the Cathars after this, instead of this being an attempt at, um, uh, you know, excommunication or, or convincing people, it becomes kill the Cathars, right? Kicks off a 20 year period of the, uh, the Catholic church trying to kill all the Cathars it can find. Um, this lasts for 20 years. Um, uh, it's this takes place largely in France. It's the French King who is like funding it and sending the troops to take care of this. It's eventually, um, ended both by the French King, not wanting to give more troops because, um, I think he had a war to fight in 1230. Um, and also, like they think they've caught the Cathars, right? They've like, there's this like, huge, yeah, right. There's this huge stronghold. They storm the stronghold. They burn 200 Cathars and it's kind of like, we did it, you know, like we're done. Dang. Um, however, they were not done. Um, this all leads us to this point in the book. So all this happens in the 1200s. Um, 1230 is when the Cathar crusade ends. Um, and things kind of 
I was going to say die down, but that feels insensitive after talking about anyway. Oh. Sorry. Um, things get quiet after the, well, that also feels insensitive. Um, oh, uh, the crusades ended and, um, uh, Catharism then goes from being this kind of, um, it, it moves from being something that's in like the, the, the limelight into smaller villages all across, um, France largely, but you'll see it around, um, Europe and other places too. Well, it becomes something that isn't as easy to track as it was when literally like a fort of Cathars, like that, that was the final, so it's like a little subculture. Yes. It becomes a subculture. Of, it just sort of grows in small towns. Yes. And it as moves all the Cathars getting together and like, Hey, we're Cathars, like, right? You yeah. Know, Catharia. And yeah. Like, yeah. Smacking each other with Fort books. Cathar. Yeah. Or yeah. being like very open about gotcha. Catharism. Uh, it kind of goes into the, goes into the dark. All right. Um, so that's where we get to with Montelieu. So the deep web of Cathar. Yeah. The dark web, the, yeah. is, okay. The subreddit. The, it is. No, it's more of a 4chan. No. Um, so, um, <laughs> the, uh, again, Montelieu, small town in the South of France. Um, it, it, we have, all these records from, you know, mid 13, you know, 1318 to 1325, because there are reports of rampant Catharism in Montelieu. Um, and, um, a Bishop Jacques Fournier, uh, 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 looks into this, these reports of heresy over the seven year period. And that's why we have all these records at the time. He collected all this into these, like, I think, I think there are four volumes and we've lost two of them. I think it's right. But it, we, we either have two or three of these giant volumes of um, firsthand reports from Jacques Fournier. Um, he would eventually become a pope and he brought this oh, report with him. Uh, innocent. No, is he, is he innocent? The 12th? No, Benedict the 12th. Does that sound right? Uh, I'll look this up as I go. But he would eventually become, uh, yeah, Benedict the 12th. So would eventually become pope. This was a report he kept with him in the Vatican Library. Um, and the reason that this book exists is that that report was rediscovered in the 1970s, I think, when this book was written, 1960s, I guess. But it was rediscovered, uh, and then um, Lettery wrote this book. His essentially only primary source is um, this set of volumes from Jacques Fournier. Cool. So um, in some sense, it's almost like a translation from you know this giant collection of Latin books in Latin about what happened in uh, Montelieu brought into um, – explained or guided for us by lettery. That's, so it's one, it's almost like a big exegesis of one primary source. Yes. That's probably the best way to put it. And, um, this image, well, what's the best way to describe it? I, th in reading this book, it very much reads like a set of concentric circles. Oh, okay. So, um, you start the book in, um, the, um, ecology of, um, the ecology of Montelieu is the first part. So you start with environment. So like literally it's what was the like elevation of Montelieu? Like what, how hilly was it? Um, and then ex these concentric circles go out and out. It goes from what did the environment look like? What was the household like? What was one of the homes? What was one of the major families like? Who were the shepherds? It, it builds out and out. That's until a we rough first chapter. That's a little, that's a lost leader right there. Uh, this actually, we'll come back to this at the end, but um, there are parts of this that are hard to read because it's like, uh, it's essentially there are stories that will repeat throughout this book, but they're reinterpreted each time. So a story will come up first as um, the how do you say see uh, the clerg family? No, clerg the clerg family. Um, so one story will be, will be brought in about the clerg, which is one of the dominant families, to show how powerful and rich they are. Will it be brought in later to show how um, heresy had um, dug its um, uh, its claws into the important families. So the same story will be used to show multiple things about Montelieu. I guess is that, that's what I think of as the concentric circles. Um, let me try to get a little further with it just as uh, just so everyone can get a handle on like what's actually happening here. Um, uh, Jacques Fournier was the head of this inquisition effort into Montelieu lasted about seven years. Um, there are 250 inhabitants in, in and around Montelieu. Um, many of them are shepherds, which means that there are about 40 households in Montelieu during this time. Um, it's quoted in the um, documents that only two of these households were untouched by heresy. So um, vast majority, those are, so essentially most of the married people, and we probably won't get to it, but most of the shepherds also had some interaction and favorable interaction with this heresy. So um, part of the difficulty in this book is that in following this concentric circle approach, you don't get the full story until you get three quarters of the way through the book itself. So if you think of the story of Montelieu as a straight line, um, you don't actually get like 
event number one until literally 234 pages into a 350 page book. Um, Woof. But listener, that's why you have me here. I'm here to guide you through this. So um, you all said that you would start, you would spread your cult by um, having these corporate retreats, which is a great mm-hmm. idea. Um, here is how heresy came to the town of Montelou. Um, one day there are these two people talking to each other. They are brothers. They are of the Authi family, Authie, A-U-T-H-I-E with an apostrophe, Authie family. This is Pierre and Guillaume. Pierre and Guillaume are talking to each other um, about a, a passage in a book that Pierre had just come across. Um, it, they don't say what the book is, um, and it's not necessarily relevant. Um, well, I guess it's whatever. It, it, they don't go into the details of the book, so get over it. Um, uh, one day, Pierre in his house was reading a certain passage in a book. He told his brother Guillaume what happened, uh, who happened to be present, to read the passage. After a moment, Pierre asked Guillaume, how does it strike you, brother? And Guillaume answered, it seems to me we have lost our souls. They have this profound religious experience by reading this book. It causes them to question, uh, indeed, to doubt their faith. Those passionate French. Those passionate French, yeah. Um, This will uh, take them to a nearby town, uh, Lombardy, where they will go to study heresy for a few years. They you, you can pick that as a major. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Right. So uh, they go off to um, learn. Right. So they they're so challenged in their faith that they need answers to these questions. They go off. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is it presumably a Cathar book? Like, is it a is that uh, like they picked up a Cathar track? Um, like, it doesn't say that. We can only guess what book uh, was that lay behind the Authier's Cathar vocation. But one thing is certain. Oh, it, it, the, I'm not going to go into the rest of it. Uh, it eventually leads to Catharism. It eventually leads to Cathar. So it's reasonable to assume that. It doesn't um, explicitly say that, though. They are trained in heresy, though, by going to Lombardy, right? That's where they, whatever questions they have are answered by Catharism. Big ultimately. city. Is, is that yeah, all it takes? Yeah. Um, so they go off uh, and learn there. They then come back to Montelou. Um, they, we had talked about our approach being more individual, that we're going to have individuals come out to our timeshare and we're going to ease them into our community. The Montelou approach is different in that it kind of combines that with, um, the primacy of the home in Montelou. So, uh, you know, to your point about things being a drag as you read through this, there's a whole chapter on like the rooms in a house, um, which I won't torture you with right now. The point being there's such a, uh, a closeness between the structure of the home and the family unit itself that it's, that the same word is used for both of them. Um, mm. it's, it's the domus and, um, the domus is like the core, um, location of loyalty in Montelou. So all these come back from Lombardy and instead of, going to the entire town and inviting people one by one, they go to the richest people in town, the clergy family. They go to the clergy. They talk to them about, um, it's a great idea. Hannibal, we should write that down. <laughs> right. So you, you, you'd want an influencer to support mm-hmm. your oh, talk to the yes. richest. Why yes. do you think we're having corporate events? Oh, oh, that's a good point. Point. These yeah. aren't community. Like, uh, I guess come get a, free soup. This yeah. is, you okay, pay a lot of money point. and then show good up point. with your corporation. And we have, um, the croc sponsorship. So I feel like there must be like some people that and we're mm-hmm. connected time, to timeshare stuff. Like yeah, yeah. we're, we're, yeah, we're aiming for the upper crust. Did you say 3000 that they're spending on this timeshare? Yeah. Okay. It's a nice place. Free yoga. So it's not nothing. Nothing. But okay. um, so the authors come back and they convince the clergy family of the correctness of Catharism. Again, we already talked through all the stuff. They, you know, um, uh, to the point that one of their sons, Pierre, Pierre Clerge, uh, who is the priest of the town, is convinced and converted to Catharism. And then Pierre uh, spreads Catharism even further. He's like preaching on it, right? He's the, he's the priest of the town. He's teaching people on Catharism. Um, and then that is how this heresy spreads across the entire, um, entire town becomes so popular. Again, 38 of 40 households, um, are touched by this heresy. They are favorable toward it in some regard. Okay. Um, so I described this as an ascetic religion. Um, the, the, the leaders of the hard cells, uh, that is true. Thank you. I should have said this before. They're, the perfects are supposed to live this ascetic lifestyle, but... Give me something attainable. Correct. So the followers in this religion follow this dual commandment of um, um, everything is corrupting. So uh, anytime you eat meat, you've corrupted yourself. Anytime 
you live in a physical body that is corrupted. Um, the world around you is full of corruption. Everything is corrupted and only God can forgive. Okay. So Catharism as the one true religion gives people forgiveness. This combination of the two that everything is corrupt. God can forgive man leads to, you can do whatever you want to. Now we're talking. Yeah, exactly. So that's where you get, so um, <laughs> the, the question I was going, so I, I'll phrase it this way, but again, uh, if you're in an ascetic religion, um, what would, you know, describe the leaders of that religion? What would they, what would they look like? What would they act like? They're like thin and gaunt yes. and, and tired, like, you know, <laughs> dizzy a lot. Sure. Yes. Um, as opposed to unimpressive houses. Oh, uh, so they're, um, uh, they, they would be poor, right? Yeah. Um, if they're rejecting physical goods. No, I mean, Pierre Clerge, who again, largely who was influential in spreading Catharism in this town, uh, is a member of the most of the wealthiest family. They don't give their wealth away as a part of joining this religion. And he, uh, uh, I think I have the description in here. Um, he, uh, is not exactly the most ascetic of individuals and denies what my, what, what one might call a traditional, uh, sexual ethic of the, uh, uh, Catholic priests. Um, uh, well, no, this is not it. Uh, oh yes. Wealth, family connections, heresy, and power. These were the four bases on which rested the influences of the clergy in Montelieu. Their local power was institutional. Pierre clergy was the village priest, though his performance of those duties was somewhat limited by his constant extracurricular activities. Mistresses took up part of the time and care which Pierre should have devoted to the edification of his flock. Um, so he was not uh, he was not chaste, is I guess what I'm trying okay. to say. But I thought, well, so he's not a he's not going for perfect parfait. Well, he goes through the consolation um, uh, uh, sacrament, so he's um, he's a member of this like upper crust of um, the Cathar religion. We'll come to a second character who's much in the same vein, but this contradiction between we're supposed to be super ascetic and not actually being is like, is the repeated theme mm. of the book, right? These characters don't live up, not characters, they're people, they're humans. These people don't live up to the goals that they set. And it seems like they don't, they're not trying to really when you get down to it. Um, uh, Pierre had a, uh, his longest relationship was with a woman named Beatrice. Um, they were, Oh, just like Dante. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like Dante. <laughs> yep. That was my takeaway from this too. Um, they, uh, were together for about two years. Uh, then Beatrice, who is a, um, an honorable woman, uh, cut, cut things off with Pierre after she, um, she became engaged to a nobleman and cut things off with Pierre after yeah. that. Good job, Beatrice. I would hope that after engagement, she would cut things off with her. Well, yeah, dudes. there's a chapter in here. Hey, there are lots of chapters. Cathars? Yeah, that's the thing. So, you know, there are 50 households in the city, and the estimate is that 10% of them commit infidelity over the course of this seven-year period. So it's not really like, you know. It's a summer of love, guys. <laughs> no, no, it's seven years of love. What do you Seven know? years of love. <laughs> it's oh, a long man. Time. No, I don't like this at all. Everything the sun touches. <laughs> Everything, <laughs> that's everything's that's, in common. Boys. Honestly, yes, that's not far off from uh, how he feels. Um, so, yeah. What was this book written? Oh, I'll, I'll pull it up in a is second. Is it the 60s, 70s? Is, 70s, is I believe. Is it feeding yeah. into that kind of? All right. Um, so just uh, uh, Beatrice and Pierre kick off their love. Um, when Beatrice is coming to confess to Pierre as priest, uh, she comes to confess to the parish priest, Pierre. Um, but as soon as she sits down in the confessional booth, he says to her, I prefer you to any other woman in the world and embraced her fervently. Uh, but she ran away. And um, anyway, so that's how they met. Well, I mean, that's coming on strong. That is coming on. It's going pretty strong. Strong. This is 75. The, 75 is when the French version came out, 78 for the English translation. Um, so yeah, I, uh, Lottery is not, Lottery is noticing the contradiction between the stated ideals of the Cathars and how they actually live. He has a fondness for Pierre Clerge of, um, he'll call him a Don Juan at, at different situations. He'll talk about his, charm how yes beatrice is who he's with the longest but he has many women who are interested in him um so there's kind of a fondness for him that i think could be off-putting in reading this book um uh, clergy will eventually so he's spreading catharism in the town ultimately the inquisition turns its eyes to it's not all he's spreading that's exactly right and <laughs> he uh um i don't think he had any um children though um he had a he had an herb that he would wear to make sure that he would um not impregnate whoever he was with so oh apparently good. it worked okay, so it's, okay. Hey, way to go buddy okay good for him yeah. um but eventually the eyes of the inquisition turned to montelieu and pierre ratted out everyone he started mm. with a family that 
uh, the clergy was essentially at war with and he ratted them out. But as is probably obvious, they then ratted him out because he was very, um, you know, out in the open about his um, heresy. Uh, Pierre then did not, Pierre then died in prison. He he was not able, or not able, what's the word? He just didn't make it to the trial, essentially, to to give him a, a punishment. So he died in prison, um, which is not great. He There's like a moment of triumph at the end for him, though. He didn't out more people than he needed to, I guess is the way to say it. Um, so he outed uh, people in, um, when the Inquisition first came to town, he did not give more names when he was in prison, is all I'm trying to say. Uh, I would say Lottery kind of paints this as like this noble thing that he did, that he at least had the dignity not to do that. Okay, so that's one uh, Pierre that we have through this book. I mean, if you're going to rat everybody out, I mean, like, set a limit. Only yeah. rat out a few. Yeah. Start, right. yeah. And again, I mean... Start small. Grow it if you have to. But it, 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 Yeah, it's tough to... All these characters are really complicated, and it's really hard to say the good guys and bad guys. Pierre Clerge does bad stuff. He also ended up fighting for orthodoxy in a weird way. Obviously, he did it for bad reasons. Just to say, all these characters are really complicated. Um, Doesn't uh, seem that complicated. Uh, uh, he did some good things. He did some bad things. He did more bad things than good, just to be clear. But And still has this respect from La Durie. That's maybe what I'm trying to say. When looking up reviews of this book, people don't like that um, La Durie likes Pierre Clerge mm-hmm. or likes aspects of him. Um, but I think that's just to say he's not only a villain. There's more to him than that, mm-hmm. I guess is to say. Um a second character who I won't be able to go into nearly as much detail with is uh, a second Pierre, uh, Pierre Maury. Uh, Pierre Maury is a shepherd. Um, the uh, Lettery uses these two characters as kind of the through lines for his exploration of kind of the inner city of Montelieu, uh, shown by the clergy family, the wealthiest family in town. Mm. And then there are these shepherds who make up, you know, what's that, like half the population of, of, of Montelieu. They live very different lives. Pierre Maury is not married. Um, He's uh, much poorer than Pierre Clerge and the Clerge clan. Um, uh, the Clerge clan is much larger than the Maurice Clerge. I think their Clerge makes up about a tenth, one tenth of the city um, approximately just from, yeah, anyway. So, um, but Pierre Maury meets a parfait, a, 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 a perfect named uh, Bella Baste. Uh, Bella Baste is a wandering preacher essentially. And, part of the Cathar religion is that you do your preaching between towns. Obviously this seems like this is how they get, this is how they avoid getting caught. Right. They just made it a religious belief though, which I just think is funny. It's like, Hey, you preach in the countryside. It's like, yeah, that's, that's where the real, real magic happens because, uh, yeah, it's like there's something holier about that instead of in the cities. And it's obviously because they would be killed if they were (laughs) caught in the cities preaching this, but it's, you know, well, why is, do you think we're in the desert? Is that, yeah, retreat yeah, 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 I like that. Yeah, and we only preach in the daytime. <laughs> oh, I like this. Oh, only when the sun, only when the stuff. sun is out, mm. and also that we the timeshare is on our property. So when they're learning, mm-hmm. you know, they they can't like report us. They can't report us for heresy. We don't do place, a whole but, lot of proselytization, but yep. if you become part of the community and you want to stay, yep. <laughs> and we lose our dang minds on the summer solstice. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, that's our party time. Is yeah. that? Oh, that's actually a good point. I like yeah, this. Winter solstice is not so much bad. Um. So Pierre Maury travels with Bella Baste for a long time. Um, um, there's just some, it's not, there's no clear reason of why Maury likes Bella Baste other than he gives solid answers to religious questions. Um, he, um, there's a confidence that he has that, you know, that Maury is not really getting from the Catholic faith because there's not like a strong Catholic representation in Montelieu, as you can tell from literally everything that we've talked about so far. Um, Pierre Maury will, support Bella Baste through, um, throughout his time in Montelieu. Uh, Maury is not wealthy, but you know, in terms of shepherds has more money than most, um, uh, supports him throughout his time, travels with Bella Baste for a long time. Um, uh, has such love for Bella Baste that he will eventually marry a woman on Bella Baste's recommendation. Maury, um, I said it was never married and except for three days, I'm correct in saying that. Um, uh, Bella Baste asked more, uh, Pierre Mori to marry his, uh, to marry, um, this woman, Raymond not revealed to Pierre Mori is that Raymond is the lover of Bella Baste. So yeah, thank you. Your, your, your quizzical response is the, is the right one. Why would, do you want to try and answer this? Why would Bella, why would Bella Baste want another man to marry his She's pregnant. lover? She's pregnant. Green Nailed card. It. Yeah. <sighs> 
What did you say? Green card. Green card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the really strict immigration laws of the 1317s and uh, yeah, good. Um, yeah. So, no, it's funny. Um, so um, uh, yeah, uh, um, Raymond is pregnant, and so say my first soap opera, boys. Yeah, but that's the thing of like <laughs> it comes across as a soap opera, doesn't it? Of um, there's backstabbing and loyalty and family and um, yeah, love, right? So uh, uh, Pierre Mori is married for three days. Uh, is then divorces Raymond on the third day because Bella Bostic commands him to divorce her. Raymond eventually gives birth. It's, you know, the book states it's unclear who the, who the parent, who the father is. It seems pretty obvious that Bella Boste impregnates Raymond gets Pierre Maury to marry her to then have, you know, plausible deniability that no, no, I as a parfait would never be with a woman. It's obviously this three day marriage that mm. caused the, but it child. seems like the whole, like having mit- mistresses and, stuff is seems to be okay if you're a parfait yes well so why is he worried about it uh, oh because the image of it is still we're supposed to be ascetic no oh, we're it, supposed to yes. be denying the pleasures of yes. the flesh i didn't know if that was like a loophole where it's like mm. no we don't eat meat we do eat fish it'd be like i don't you know when, when i he, don't sleep too too much but i totally right. boink uh he and uh raymond shared a room together and uh but uh, Bella Basta would make this huge show, not uh, whatever. He would, he would always be very uh, clear that he was wearing his clothes as he like went to bed. R- right. So obviously he's sleeping with her, but to his followers, he wants them to think, no, no, we have this like pure or holy relationship where, you know, I sleep in my clothes. She just happens to sleep in the same bed as me. R- exactly. Yeah. No. There's, there's a, there's a, there's like a credulence. Right? No, just... it's perfectly reasonable. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. You you took the opposite <laughs> side. I thought you would. Okay. So um, depends how big, I mean, if it's, if it's anything larger than the twin, I think that's all right. Good. You might do that with clothes on guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally fine. Um, um, eventually, uh, Bell Baste will be, uh, uh, caught, uh, by the inquisition. And I forget if he was one of the few that it's actually put to the stake, but, um, from this, uh, Inquisition time in. So he made him eat meat. Is that what you're saying? I was just gonna say. No, he swore that off. He can't. <laughs> <laughs> they can put him to the fish. Thank you. Well done. But uh, oh, man, uh, but there uh, of the uh, 250. Waka waka. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> of the no, of the 250 people who are in the region, five of them are ultimately uh, burned at the stake. Um, many more of them die in prison, and some of them have like harsh prison sentences, which leads one to think that they were like essentially killed by the prison sentence. Jeez. But um, not, you know. While many of them are found to be heretics, they are not. Um, they're not all burned at the stake, is what I'm trying to say. They're not all hang. They're not all. It, it's not as bloody as uh, many Inquisition stories are made out to be, for what that's worth. Okay, I'm rushing through it at this point, but I, just to get to the spot at the end, um, how does this approach to history strike you as compared to a history of private life? I mean, having all of the documents and going through it in kind of that. Um, concentric circle kind of way. Yes. Very interesting. Yes. Um, uh, it does sort of feel like the author's playing a trick or... In what way? He's just sort of like conjuring your expectations. Because you said he'll present one story and then later he'll come back to that story and say, ah, now this story is different. Now that you oh. know something different that I've told you, it sure. kind of feels like you're being managed as opposed to being sure. just sure, sure. like straight out he clearly had story you're totally right um he could have told a linear story and didn't he uh, it comes across more as deepening those earlier stories Mm -hmm. and there's something there's a way that it builds where so even you know in in knowing the word is parfait for this level of of people in the organization there's a way that it builds where you are essentially learning the language of catharism by the end of the book right yeah and so that building doesn't come across as manipulative more as the book respects you enough to say, if you're paying attention, you'll understand this. And if you're not, Mm -hmm. you're going to have no idea what's being said sentence to sentence. Um, Same with, you know, essentially at least half of those 250 are named in the book. Mm -hmm. If you're not paying attention, you'll have no idea who he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, So it rewards a a close reading, I guess I would say. It doesn't come across as manipulative in the way you're talking about. Is your, when you, is the impression that you're left with when you're done that see, that was an accurate depiction of these seven years. Whereas yeah. in the earlier book, it was like, we're t- we are summarizing a thousand years in a paragraph and right. boiling it all down to, you know, oppression. Yeah, it feels like a much more full treatment, right? Yes. To return to the same thing over and over again from new perspective. Yes. That actually seems nice to me. Sometimes, yeah. Go, anyway, what were you going to say? You have you pulled your book out like you had something important. Mm, no, I don't know. Uh, 
there is a respect for the actual stories of these people. It's not as clear cut as the history of private life. Everything is just more complicated. Your question of does it come across as a correct reading? And I would say yes. They're direct quotes from um, the people going through this inquisition. I will say, just as in case anyone else is thinking this, the our primary source is a bishop interrogating in, to, people. Yeah, and so the, in some sense, it is uh, biased. One would say. And but even, you get this, but my understanding, just from what you're talking about, is that the author, what's his name? Lottery. Lottery is critical of the Catholic bishop and sympathetic to the Cathars. I would not say that. Oh, okay. So he will call the, he will call the Cathars heretic throughout the entire book. Um, his introduction where he um, talks about um, um, Jacques Fournier um, uh, as the head of the off, at the head of the office was, of course, Jacques Fournier himself a sort of compulsive, um, I don't know what that word is, immune to both supplication and bribe, skillful at worming out the truth or bringing the lambs forth, as his victim said, able to able in a few minutes to tell a heretic from a proper Catholic, a very devil of an inquisitor, according to the accused. He proceeded and succeeded essentially through the diabolical and tenacious skill of the, his interrogations. Only rarely did he have recourse to torture. Um, he was fanatical about detail and present in person at almost all the sittings of his own court. And it goes on from there. I think he has a respect for Fournier, um, mm-hmm. at least in the information that he gets from these people. Um, he'll tell stories in this introduction about how um, there were much bloodier inquisitions and he could have pressed more charges and he doesn't. Um, um, he encounters um, a, a, someone who's Jewish in the course of his inquisition. And instead of there being punishment, he spends days and days trying to convince this person of the faith. And ultimately there's no punishment at the end of it. Mm-hmm. So, I think he's giving a fair treatment to um, the bishop in this. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, can I just to yeah, if I can move on to the wrap up part of it? Um, so yes. So I already mentioned that um, Lettery is a you know third wave in the same school of thought that George Dubuis is a, a member of. Um, he will also call out call out um, Philip Philippe Arez. I'm very bad at all this. I'm sorry. Who was the other chief editor of the History of Private Life in his preface? He'll say that um, uh, Philippe, uh, um, is it Philippe Arie? Aries, 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 um, calls him out for this um, theory that he has about how essentially parents didn't care about their kids until the modern age. And Lettery says that that is in direct contradiction to firsthand evidence that he'll present in this book, right? So while not actually bringing in a history of private life explicitly, both of the main authors and their approaches to history are called out in the course of this book Mm. to the point that we get to the end. Um, so it's, it's all essentially direct quotes and then an explanation of what those quotes mean. That's the vast majority of the book until these last three pages. So he really is containing himself to a very small portion of interpretation, um, as regards these events. Um, although the stu- the study has been confined to one village, Montelieu brings to mind the more general ideas of the philosophers and economists who have interpreted themselves in the method of domestic production. Marx spoke of early economies in which the econo- in which the economic whole was really contained in each individual house, which formed its own independent center of production. Uh, and then he goes on to say that, well, that's not true in Montelieu. This approach to production that Marx says is true everywhere um, um, during um, essentially during um, feudalism isn't true in Montelieu. So there are cases where this isn't true and then he'll undermine. Um, uh, I, I just think, uh, but Marx was thinking here of geographically scattered dwellings, which rightly or wrongly he took to be the rule in ancient Germania, which feels like a stab, right? It's, it's him saying that. So he's basically saying like, Mar- so it's a lot more complicated yes. than the reductionist Marxist view. Correct. Who knew? Yes, exactly. Um, he'll list a few other um, economists here, but Marx is his first one. And he's like, uh, Marx was wrong. Is, is really the, the takeaway of it right there. Um, this is the very end of it. Um, um, in our last conversation, Graham made a point about how the, uh, the people who wrote a history of private life did not have a love for Rome as they were writing about Rome, which I thought at the time was a really dumb point. Just sorry I say it. That's right. Um, but in reading this book, I'm struck it's by my burden. Well, um, actually you're, you're right is why I'm bringing it up. That's um, my burden. That's wonderful to be right. You are, you are truly a Cassandra to this point. People not recognize when yes, you're right. Exactly. Yeah. Cassandra. Uh, but I'm recognizing I'm, I'm recanting my incorrect belief from before. Um, did you just reference Greek myth there? Cassandra? I, I said Cassandra I, 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 first. I, 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 oh, do you I, 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 first? Well, okay. I see how it is. Um, that, um, um, Lettery has a respect for the people he's talking about, even 
even the bad guys, right? That they're still people who uh, have mixed lives and do good things and bad things and, you know, are liars, but they're good fathers or they provide for their family, but they, you know, are mean to their wife or whatever. They're, so they're, they're not just oppressors or they're yes. not just oppressed. He has a line earlier yeah. where he's like, uh, <laughs> I, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but he's like, you can understand this as uh, men and women not liking each other, but uh, class conflict would be the worst way to understand this event. And it's like, <laughs> oh, he's talking about Marx right there. <laughs> um, so there's a bunch of stuff that's great in there. This is the very end of the book. So if you'll remember from History of Private Life, it in I think we included this. Yeah, we included the Patreon discussion. The very last paragraph of the first book was this thing about the um the coffins and on the coffins are like this extravagance that um you know an, an entire society lies revealed in the opulence of these um unnecessary coffins that people were buried in, right? It's this mm-hmm. like contemptuous uh line about um these coffins that they're or not what's the what's the word for it not coffin like ossuaries uh yes what's the sarcophagi sarcophagi that's the word i'm looking for um so here's his final line of his study of this region um actually i'll give you the whole paragraph just for kicks and giggles jacques fournier took it upon himself to remedy all of um this heresy today catharism is no more than a dead star whose cold but fascinating light reaches us now after an eclipse of more than half a millennium but montelieu itself is much more than a courageous but fleeting deviation it is the factual history of ordinary people it is pierre and beatrice and their love it is pierre maury and his flock it is the breath of life restored through a repressive latin register that's the the book he's he's reading from that is the monument of occitan literature that's the region the dialect of french Montelieu is the physical warmth of the Ostal, which is the Domus, which is the, the, the home. Montelieu is the physical warmth of the Ostal, together with the ever-recurring promise of a peasant heaven, the one within the other, the one supporting the other. It's a beautiful line. Um, it's a deep respect that he holds for these people and what they go through during this Inquisition. So we'll talk more about uh, in our Patreon in between about kind of a comparison of these two approaches to history. I do think there are weaknesses to it that we should talk about. Cool. But um uh, it's a it's a uh, it's dry at parts it's a great book i get it, it, um I, I feel like all i ever want to say at the end of my episodes is like just go read the book but uh if you want to it's montelieu the promised land of error by emmanuel leroy ladouri rock and roll that's awesome well thank you maybe this yeah. has been classical stuff you should know we uh you know where to find us and if you don't just like go to the back at <laughs> the beginning of the episode <laughs> and try to listen to me and not everybody the chuckleheads here uh, sorry not sorry in the background Um, But yeah, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next week. Next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.